In this chapter, we'll define our own simple markup language and parse documents within this language into Haskell data structures. Our markup language will contain the following features, headings, prefix by number of star characters, paragraphs, a group of lines without empty lines in between, unordered lists, a group of lines, each prefix with a dash, ordered lists, a group of lines, each prefix with a hashtag, and code blocks, a group of lines, each prefix with a greater than sign. Here's a sample document. It starts with a heading, then we have a few paragraphs, a code block, more text, text, another code block, and a few lists, which will eventually convert into this HTML. Heading, paragraph, paragraphs, code block, code blocks, paragraph, and lists. There's a clear difference between Haskell and similar ML family languages, and most mainstream languages, is the ability to represent data precisely. So how do we represent our markup language using Haskell? Previously, in our HTML builder library, we used new types to differentiate between HTML documents, structures, and titles. But we didn't really need to differentiate between different kinds of structures, such as paragraphs and headings, not without parsing the data at least. In this case, we have a list of structures, and each structure could be one of a few specific specific options, a paragraph, a heading, a list, etc. And we want to be able to know which structure is which, so we can easily convert it into the equivalent HTML representation. For that, we have data definitions. Data give us the ability to create custom types by grouping multiple types together and having alternative structures. Think of them as a combination of both structs and enums if you're coming from other languages. Data declarations look like this, really similar to new type, but there are two important differences. In the types part, we can write many types like int, string, or boolean, for new types, we can only write one. And we can have alternative structures using pipe. New types have no alternatives. This is because new type is used to provide a type safe alias and data is used to build a new composite type that can potentially have alternatives. Let's see a few examples of data types. Here we created a new data type named boolean with the possible values true or false. In this case, we only have constructor alternatives and none of the constructors carry additional values. This is similar to enums in other languages. Now we created a new data type named person where the string is a name and int is age. We can create values of the type person like this. In this case, we create a composite of multiple types without alternatives. This is similar to structs in other languages, but structs give each field a name and here we distinguish them by position. Alternatively, Haskell has synthetic sugar for naming fields called records. We can change the definition of a person to look like this. Values of this type can be written exactly as before or with alternative syntax. Haskell will also generate functions that can be used to extract the fields from the composite type. In this case, it will generate two functions, name for accessing the name and age for accessing the age. And we can use them like this. We even have special syntax for updating specific fields in a record. Of course, we do not update records in place, we generate a new value instead. Unfortunately, having specialized functions for each field also means that if we define different types, the function which GC needs to generate will clash. The easiest way to solve this is to give fields unique names, for example, by adding a prefix. Another way is by using extensions to the Haskell language, which we'll cover in later chapters. This one is pretty similar to person, but we can plug any type we want to this definition. For example, tuple of string and boolean, or tuple of two characters. Actually, we don't have to re-implement this type. Haskell already has this type, and it has a special syntax. This tuple definition is polymorphic. We define the structure, but able to plug different types into the structure to get concrete types. You can think of tuple as a template for a data type waiting to be filled, or as a function waiting for types as input in order to return a data type. We can even take a look at the type signature of tuple in GCI using the kind command. A quick detour to kinds. The kind command is called as such because a type of a type is called a kind. Kinds can be one of two things, either a type, which is denoted as star, which means a saturated or concrete type, such as int or person, or an arrow of two kinds, which is, as you might have guessed, a type function taking kind and returning a kind. Note that only types that have the kind star or type can have values. So for example, while tuple int is a valid Haskell concept that has the kind star to star, or type to type, and we can write code that will work generically for all types that have a certain kind, for example, star to star or type to type, we cannot construct a value that will have the kind star to star or type to type. All values have types and all types that have values have the kind star or type. We will talk more about kinds later. For now, let's focus on types. 
A standard data type either is similar to a tuple, but instead of having only one constructor, we have two. This means that we can choose which side we want. Here are a couple of values of type either string and int. This type is useful for modeling errors. Either we succeed and got what we wanted, the right constructor with the value, or we did not and got an error instead, the left constructor with a string of custom error type. We created a new module named markup. In our program, we use data types to model the different kinds of content types in our markup language. We tag each structure using the data constructor and provide the rest of the information, the paragraph text or list items and so on. Note that natural is defined in the base package, but not exported from prelude. Let's export all the types. And this time we want to export the constructors of the structure. Now we have enough to represent the following markup documents as values of document. First exercise is to write a paragraph, second is to add a heading to it, then add a few lists, and then create a proper blog post with headings, code blocks, and different kinds of lists. Let's cheat a bit and skip to the exercise number four right away because it has everything we need. Okay, we need to create my document of type document. This one is not a scope, so we need to import it. Because the document type is list of structures, the most simple document is just an empty list. Next, we have to start filling up structures one by one. First is a heading. We have to pass what kind of heading it is, and then the heading itself. Paragraph wraps a text. Then we add a code block. Code block is also a list, but a list of strings. The first code block is just one line. And note that we have to escape the strings inside the strings. Then another paragraph and another code block. This code block consists of multiple lines, another paragraph, and an unordered list, which is also a list of strings, similar to a code block. Then we add another paragraph, ordered list, which is similar to the unordered list, and finish it up with another paragraph. And now we have our first complete document written as a Haskell data type. And you might ask, why do we need to represent the markup as a type? Why don't we convert it into HTML as soon as we parse it instead? That's a good question and a valid strategy. The reason we represent it as a Haskell type is flexibility and modularity. If the parsing code is coupled with the HTML generation, we lose the ability to pre-process the markup document. For example, we might want to take only a small part of the document for a summary and present it, or create a table of content from headings, or maybe we would like to add other targets, not just HTML, maybe markdown format, parsing to an abstract data type, one that does not contain the details of the language, for example, no hashtags or stars, gives us the freedom to do so much more than just conversion to HTML. That is usually worth it doing this way, unless you really need to optimize the process. Let's have a look at how to parse a multi-line string of markup text written by a user and convert it to the document type that we defined in the previous part. Our strategy is to take the string of markup text and first split it to a list where each element represents a separate line and second, go over the list by line by line and process it, remembering information from previous lines if necessary. So the first thing we want to do is to process the string line by line. We can do that by converting the string to a list of strings. Fortunately, the Haskell Prelude module from the Haskell standard library base exposes a function called lines that does exactly what we want. The Prelude module is exposed in every Haskell file by default, so we don't need to import it. For the line processing part, let's start by ignoring all of the markup syntax and just group lines together into paragraphs. Paragraphs are separated by an empty line and iteratively add new features later in the chapter. A common solution in operative programs would be to iterate over the lines using some sort of loop construct and accumulate lines that should be grouped together into some intermediate mutable variable. When we reach an empty line, we insert the content of that variable into another mutable variable that accumulates the results. Our approach in Haskell is not so different, except that we do not use loops or mutable variables. Instead, we use recursion. Consider the following contrived example. Let's say that we want to write an algorithm for adding two natural numbers together, and we don't have a standard operation to do that. We don't have a plus, but we do have two operations we could use on each number, increment and decrement. A solution we could come up with is to slowly pass one number to the other number iteratively by incrementing one and decrementing the other. And we do that until the number with the increment reaches zero. For example, let's take three and two. We start with three and two. We increment three and decrement two. On the next step, we now have four and one. We increment four and decrement one. And on the next step, we now have five and zero. Since the second number is zero, we declare five as a result. This can be written with imperative loop. While the second number is not zero, we increment the first one and decrement the second one. And when we get out of the loop, we return the first number. We can write the same algorithm in Haskell without mutation using recursion. So while m is not equal to zero, we keep
keep calling the same function, increment is the first number, decrement is the second number, and at the end we return the first number. In Haskell, in order to emulate iteration with mutable state, we call the function again with the values we want the variables to have in the next iteration. Recursion commonly has a bad reputation for being slow and possibly unsafe compared to loops. But this is because in imperative languages, calling a function often requires creating a new call stack. However, functional languages and Haskell in particular play by different rules and implement a feature called tail call elimination. When the result of a function call is the result of the function, which is called tail position, we can just drop the current stack frame and then allocate one for the function we call, so we don't require n stack frames for n iterations. This is of course only one way to do tail call elimination, and other strategies exist, such as translating code from recursive version to iterative version. Haskell plays by slightly different rules, because it uses a lazy evaluation strategy, instead of the much more common strict evaluation strategy. An evaluation strategy refers to when do we evaluate computation. In a string languages, the answer is simple. We evaluate the arguments of a function before entering a function. So for example, the evaluation of add increment 3 and decrement 2 using strict evaluation will look like this. First, we evaluate increments 3 to 4, and then we evaluate decrement 2 to 1, and at the end we evaluate add 4 and 1. Or alternatively, depending on the language, we reverse 1 and 2 and evaluate the arguments from right to left instead of left to right. On the other hand, with lazy evaluation, evaluation, we only evaluate computation when we need it, which is when it's part of the computation that will have some effect on the outside world. For example, writing a computation to standard output or sending it over the network. So unless the computation is required, it won't be evaluated. For example, we need the result of add increment 2 and decrement 3 in order to know which message to write. So it will be evaluated in this case. Here we don't actually need 5, so we don't evaluate it and we don't evaluate adding two numbers. But then if we know we need add increment increment 2 and decrement 3, do we use strict evaluation now? The answer is no, because we might not need to evaluate the arguments. So in this case, const ignores the second argument and returns the first one. So we don't actually need to evaluate decrement 3 part in order to provide an answer to the computation and in turn output an answer to the screen. With lazy evaluation strategy, we will evaluate expressions when we need to, when they are required in order to do something for the user. And we evaluate from the outside in, so to say. First, we enter functions and then we evaluate the arguments when we need to. Usually when the thing we want to evaluate appears in some control flow, such as the condition of an if expression or a pattern in a pattern matching. Let's get back to the recursion. In general, when we're trying to solve problems recursively, it's useful to think about the problem in three parts. Finding the base case, the most simple case, the ones that we already know how to answer, figure out how to reduce the problem to something simpler so it gets closer to the base case, and mitigating the difference between the reduced version and the solution we need to provide. The reduce and mitigate steps together are usually called the recursive step. Let's take a look at another example problem. Generating a list of particular size with a specific value in place of every element. In Haskell, this function would have the following signature. Number of element, the element, and the resulting list of element. How would we implement this function recursively? Or how would we describe it in three steps? The base case, the cases we already know how to generate are the cases where the length of the list is zero or less. We just return an empty list. Otherwise, we we do the recursive step. The reduced part is, while we might not know how to generate a list of size n, where n is a positive number, if we knew the solution for n minus 1, we could add another element to the solution for n minus 1 using the cons operator. Here are a few usage examples of replicate. Four elements of true, zero elements of true, and two elements of two. When solving functions recursively, we usually call the same function again. But that doesn't have to be the case. It's possible to reduce our problem to something simpler that requires an answer from a different function. If in turn that function will, or another function is that call chain, call our function again, we have a mutual recursive solution. For example, let's write two functions, one that checks whether a natural number is even or not, and one that checks whether a number is odd or not, only by decrementing it. Let's start with even. How should we solve this recursively? The base case, we know the answer for zero. It's true. For reduction, we might not know the answer for general n, but we could check whether n minus 1 is odd. If n minus 1 is odd, then n is even. If it's not odd, then n is not even. So what about odd? Base case, we know the answer for zero. It's false. And again, we might not know the answer for a general n, but we could check whether n minus 1 is even. If n minus 1 is even, then n is odd. 
If it's not even, then n is not odd. Because we did not handle the negative number cases in the examples, our function will loop forever when a negative value is passed as an input. A function that does not return a result for some value, either by not returning or by throwing an error, is called a partial function, because it only returns a result for a part of the possible inputs. Partial functions are generally considered bad practice because they can't have undesired behaviors at runtime, a runtime exception or infinite loop. So we want to avoid using in partial functions as well as avoid writing partial functions. The best way to avoid writing partial function is by covering all inputs. In the situation before, it's definitely possible to handle negative numbers as well, so we should do that. Or instead, we could require that our function accepts a natural type instead of integer, and then the type system would have stopped us from even using these functions with values that we did not handle. There are cases where we can't possibly cover all inputs. In these cases, it's important to re-examine the code and see if we could further restrict the inputs using types to mitigate this issue. For example, the head function from prelude promises to return the first element or the head of a list, but we know that list could possibly be empty, so how can this function deliver on its promise? Unfortunately, it cannot, but there exists a different function that can, which is head from the module data list non empty. The trick here is that this other head does not take a general list as an input, it takes a different type entirely, one that promises to have at least one element and therefore can deliver on its promise. We can also potentially use smart constructors with new type and enforce some sort of restriction in the type system, as we saw in earlier chapters. But this solution can sometimes be less ergonomic to use. An alternative approach is to use the data types to encode the absence of proper result. For example, use a maybe, as we'll see in future chapters. Make sure that the functions you write return a result for every input either by constructing the input using types or by encoding the absence of a result using types. But let's go back to the task at hand. As stated previously, our strategy for parsing the markup text is this. Split the strings to a list where each element is a separate line, which we can do with lines, and go over the list line by line and process it, remembering information from previous lines, if necessary. Remember that we want to start by ignoring all the markup syntax and just group lines together into paragraphs. Paragraphs are separated by an empty line, and iteratively add new feature later in the chapter. The parse functions takes a string and returns a document. We call the parse line functions, to which we pass a list that contains the currently grouped paragraph, and because we start in the recursion it's an empty one. Then in the parse line we care about the current paragraph and the rest of the texts. Because of laziness, paragraph is not computed until it's needed. So we don't have to worry about the performance implication in the case that we are still grouping lines. Note here that we are reversing the result, and we'll come back to this later. We saw case expression used to to deconstruct new types and characters, but we can also use pattern match on lists and other ADTs as well. In this case, we match against two patterns, an empty list and a console, a list with at least one element. In the body of the pattern, we bind the first element to the name current line and the rest of the elements to the name rest. We'll talk about how all of this works really soon. Then we check the current line. So when we run into an empty line, we can add the accumulated paragraph to the resulting list, because recall a document is a list of structures and start the function again with the rest of the input. Otherwise, we are still in the same paragraph and do a recursive step. We pass the new lines to be grouped in a paragraph in reverse order because of performance characteristics, because of the nature of singly linked lists. Prepending an element is fast and appending is slow. Prepending only requires us to create a new con cell to hold a pointer to the value and a pointer to the list, but appending requires us to traverse the list to its end and rebuild the con cells so this whole code allows us to group together paragraphs in a structure. But how do we view our results? In the next part, we'll take a short detour and talk about type classes and how they can help us in this scenario. And then we'll continue parsing the markup.